so thank you for attending this talk um, about the state of uh, GitLab and the cloud, uh, what happened in the previous year and what's gonna uh, happen in the next few, in the, in the near future. Uh, so I'm Benjamin Tiso, you can find me uh, with Bentis uh, over IRC on OFTC. Um, I'm a free desktop admin, as most of you know, or some people know at least. And this is a further presentation of the one I gave last year. Um, for those who were not here last year, I have a one minute short summary of uh, what happened last year. So if you look back at the slides from last year, uh, in January 2020, uh, the treasurer, uh, Daniel Vetter, came back and said, hey, we're having a $6,000 um, bill from Google for this project these months and if we keep growing that way then you are going to have to shut down the CI. So the trader was not happy, everybody was not happy. Um, some people like me were involved into writing some new tools. Uh, we've got the car free space in, uh, introduced. The artifacts were chased down with uh, many project leaders, thanks a lot for them. And then uh, we also wrote uh, some git cache uh, for Mesa. And all in all, this all reduced uh, the build uh, from 6,000 to 3,000 months. Uh, so we are happy, um, but since there, a lot have moved. And so this presentation is mostly understanding what we did for the past 12 months uh, to actually reduce the bill and why, where we are now and what's the future. Uh, so first and foremost, I think everybody is um, interested in those numbers. This is how much we spent for um, to pay for the GitLab hosting for uh, towards Google. Uh, so this is uh, money that is taken from the organization. Um, as you can see, there has been several uh, periods. Uh, the first few months where we were at 3,000, a little bit more, and then we suddenly started to fall down. So what actually happened during those times? So between September and February, um, as mentioned previously, the heat was gone. Uh, we, the treasurer was saying that we are in a much reasonable state. Um, but if you look at the number more carefully, you'll see that they are slightly increasing. Uh, they are slightly increasing, not so much because of uh, we are not good at doing what we do, but there are more and more CI involved and more CI involved, more download, more and more cost. So it was time to prototype a better solution. Also, if you remember at the very last uh, slide of my talk uh, last year, I was telling you that uh, Equinix Metal, which was pocket, packet.net at the time, um, allowed us to, and they afford us to, to host our own cluster uh, on their uh, platform. So that's what we plan to do during this, that period. And we try to, to prototype a solution. We self-inflicted three constraints. Um, the first one, um, which is not so much of a constraint, but anyway, uh, was to keep the container registry in Google Cloud Storage. At the time, it was six terabytes of data, uh, which means that um, it would have been slightly difficult to bring back in-house on a non-very, I mean, we had too many unknowns in terms of uh, storage, um, too many, um, anyway, it was it was kind of difficult to bring all these data in house and not being sure that it was reliable enough. We also wanted to have something equivalent to Google Cloud Platform. Uh, we were really happy with the Kubernetes deployment that we were having previously, um, but uh, there are a few bits here and there with the Google Cloud Platform that allows us to have something which is really nice to to deal with when you're a sysadmin. And last but not least, we wanted to do the migration to the new cluster without much downtime. We didn't want to impact the various projects hosted on gitlab.freestop.org. And so that required us to add some quirks to be able to make sure that we do the transition while it's still up. So in January 2021, I finally got a prototype for um, that new cluster. I use the case release as a base um, for two reasons. The first one is that it's already something that we were familiar with because the Git cache that I, that I mentioned previously was already deployed through K3S. 
and also KSWS is really simple and easy to deploy. KSWF is a project by Rancher, owned by Suzino. Um, so they are good guys, anyway. Um, we are relying on three machines uh, from Equinix Metal. Uh, one server, uh, which is called the control plane in the Kubernetes world, uh, and two agents. To keep the some sort of confidentiality with uh, between the cluster and the rest of the machines that we have on packet, we decided to use a wire guard for the internal communication. Um, we also used uh, Ceph uh, for anything that is deemed light in terms of size, uh, but where you actually need to have a lot of uh, transactions. Uh, so that would be for Git and database. Ceph is a distributed file system um, that you can plug in on Kubernetes very easily. And for everything that would be heavier, uh, we would use um, Equinix Metal Elastic Storage. Uh, so that would be for the artifacts. Artifacts are not very um, they are important, but they are not critical in terms of access time and all this kind of stuff. So Equinix, the Elastic Storage there is the same kind of things that we have on Google Cloud Platform when you can attach a disk uh, for a size, you just have to pay for it anyway. Uh, to be able to have a um, node on time, uh, between for the transition, we connected two clusters together by using a project which is named Kilo that basically creates some wire guard entry points between clusters. And also to be able to make it transparent for people, we use some custom code between tunnels to link service together. Go between is really a net a net cat. However, there are two pieces that you don't uh, that that you have on Google Cloud Platform and that you don't get if you just deploy some bar metal. Kubernetes. The first one is the um, logging. Um, Google Cloud Platform has some very nice logging mechanism in place. You don't have anything to do. You just create your cluster. You've got all of the pieces together. You've got the database, and you can work through the database very easily. Uh, to get the same equivalent thing, uh, I deployed a thing which is called EKS, which is the Elastic, Star Elastic Search. Uh, stack so it's Elasticsearch, Kibana, and some other um, bits here and there, um, which seem to be working well enough in the deployment, in the test deployment. Um, so we started by using that. The second problem of uh, the second thing that we get from Google Cloud Platform is the redundancy of the main server. Everything uh, is backed up within Google, um, and actually, what we have right now. Um, I mean, in January, uh, we had to emulate all of these Kubernetes facilities with the control plane in-house, and we were having just one server doing that. So that was a little bit problematic, but we had to move on because I was seeing the numbers growing up and um, couldn't really um, wait too long for that. So at the end of January 2021 um, and beginning of February, uh, we started the migration from Google Cloud Platform. Uh, over two weeks, we moved all of the Git repos from, Equinix, uh, from Google Cloud Platform to Equinix Metal. We also moved most of the artifacts. Um, we moved all of the jobs logs and also a couple of, couple of months before the migrations for all of the artifacts um, uh, per se. And on a Sunday, uh, February 7, uh, we shut down the service on Google Cloud Platform. We did a DB migration, we updated the DNS, and we put it back together. And then the next few months, we gradually killed the services on Google Cloud Platform. It was very enjoyable, and we removed the nodes. So this is why on February 20, in February 2021, uh, there is a big drop in the in the bill from Google. Uh, we were not using Google Cloud Platform anymore. We were just using some storage there and some VMs for most of the things. So you can see that it was pretty efficient from day one. Uh, we were really happy about that. The Trezor was really happy about that. Um, so that was good. That was good. And you can also see that as we kill the VMs, the cost um, gets done uh, by 600, five, five to 600. Okay, 
So that leads us roughly to between March and May 2021. Um, I was actually a little bit worried at the time uh, because we were not having this high availability control plane that Google Cloud Platform was offering for free. Uh, it was even worse because the control plane, the server, had no backups uh, in the same way, uh, in a way that we could not put it back together. Uh, however, it's, GitLab has the backups. Uh, we are running daily backups of their entire GitLab server, which means that if we would lose the cluster, uh, we would have to bring it back together from scratch, uh, which means probably a couple of days or more realistically a week of work where no other project can work on GitLab and they cannot accept merge requests and all this kind of stuff. So that was not comfortable. So what I did was doing uh, my research. I discovered a few projects. Uh, one of them is uh, KubeVip, Kubernetes virtual IPs, um, which allowed me to understand a little bit more about what is BGP and how it works. We, in the meantime, K3S got improved for the high availability control plane part. Um, and I started prototyping a K3S cluster with high availability control plane. And that's where I <clears throat> had one of the scariest days of my life, I think, um, where basically on May 11, or May 12, something like that, right before going into vacation, I remember, I was to see the automated deployment of the cluster. Of course, I was doing my um, automated deployment, making sure that it was working, writing some docs. And at the very end of the day, I was like, okay, I need to do the full, the full deployment to see if, if it's working. And so I followed the fresh documentation, deployed test cluster onto the production cluster. Immediately after, I saw that GitLab was done. Um, and if I logged into the, the, the production cluster, nothing was working anymore. We didn't have any disk, we didn't have any workload, we, we just had a fresh cluster. So it took me a little bit of time to calm down, to think threat of what happened. And it turns out that um, the data was not lost. It was only hidden or not used. Uh, the, if you deploy a K3S without the high availability control plane, uh, basically all of the cluster state is stored in a SQLite database. If you deploy it with, um, if you deploy it with the uh, high availability control plane, uh, basically what happened is that you're using an ETCD database. So, and the thing is, K3S would not destroy the data whenever it was redeployed. So I was able to tear down the cluster, back up everything, well, back up everything, tear down the cluster, redeploy a new cluster, reset, refresh the SQL database with the backups that I did, and everything was backup. I was really happy. Um, I think I think the, the the most funny part of the day was that people were actually uh, thanking me for fixing things while actually uh, uh, completely killed the, the cluster um, in the first place. But yeah, I, I took the praise. Thanks. <laughs> that gives us to the second part um, that was very worrying uh, in the choice that we made previously. Um, at around that same period, um, I realized something and I, I immediately emailed our Equinix Metal sponsor. I realized last Saturday that the Elastic Storage we, is going to be decommissioned very soon on June 1st. We were three weeks before uh, June 1st. I can't thank them enough uh, because their answer was the following. I think your approaching of expanding your cluster to include more local disk is the right option. Feel free to leverage some S1 machines or additional M1 to help you make it happen. To give you an idea, S1 machines have 12 hard drive of two terabytes each, which means that basically they gave us the, the keys to some very, very large machines that, that we could use to store all of our data. So thank you. Thank you a lot. Um, not sure if you can see the animation with the uh, with the screen sharing, but um, we were really really happy uh, with the Equinix method. So thank you. 
So at the end of May, I've got a new prototype. I've got six machines now this time, three server, three agents. It was using K3S high availability, uh, using Kubevit, the project I mentioned just previously, BGP, of course. Um, it was fully deployed with a Python script. Uh, it was also using Minio cluster for saving the artifacts. Uh, this is a file serving uh, project uh, that worked really, really well for the Git cache uh, that we're using. Uh, so we're not using it. And we are using some dedicated elastic IPs for GitLab and the other service because we can now. On May 24, uh, we put the new cluster in production. We actually did the migration, the Git migration, a couple of weeks before. Uh, nobody noticed it, nobody, I think. And on May 24, we shut down the, the cluster. We did the DB migration. We put it back up in the same way we did the previous migration. We were really happy for five minutes because Minayo immediately started to show some weaknesses in the artifacts upload. Uh, a lot of people were starting to complain that their job was successful, but as soon as the artifacts were involved, they were trying to upload the artifacts and the artifacts were failing. So initially we thought that this was because of the, um, uh, because we were still syncing the artifacts that are between the previous um, storage and the new storage. But after a couple of days, we realized that it was not the case anymore and Minayo was just doing things playing wrong. So we had to go back to the drawing board. And we ended up selecting Ceph for Brick Storage as a replacement. I already mentioned that we're using Ceph for the file system over Kubernetes, and turns out that Ceph also has something which is called Ceph Object Storage, which is the exact same thing that Minayo. It's an Amazon S3 API that you can use in Kubernetes or in our cloud environments and it works just fine and even way better than Mineo. So after one small week of testing, we put it in production and immediately after it was way better for people. So first week of June, 2021, the cluster was back up. Uh, it seemed much better, but we actually lost all of the artifacts that are for the previous week. Um, excuse me, I just saw an IRC, uh, Daniel, making fun of me. Um, so the the artifact that I for the previous week was lost because of um, an issue with Minayo. Uh, I thought that the Minayo was actually um, safe and I would be able to shut down one of the machines and turns out that it was not. And so we lost all of the artifacts. So if you look at the numbers, uh, you'll see that there is no um, uh, there is no impact on the Google Cloud Platform bill, of course, because the Google Cloud Platform bill only relies on the uh, on the uh, registry uh, cost, which are completely unrelated to uh, this migration. But how, however, you can see that the uh, entire uh, the, the, the global cost is still decreasing, and that's because we tried to, to make it happen by uh, deploying a Docker cache. Uh, the Docker cache is located at registry mirror.freedesktop.org, uh, which means that it's local to the Freedest, to the Equinix Metal machines that we're having. Um, and actually, if you have if you're having runners, uh, it would be nice if you could make them point at this particular URL instead of the registry for the stop the talk. What we do in the in the free desktop runner, we just override in the uh, slash etc slash host the IP, uh, so that they are told to use the cache, and so it it saves us a few a few bucks. It doesn't work completely as expected. Sometimes it just fails. We have to kick the we have to kick to, you have to kick the process once or twice, like today. Uh, but still, it allows us to have a sub 1,000 amounts uh, Google bill. Um, so the treasurer is happy. I hope that Daniel, you are happy. Um, and uh, and so, yeah. So after this long introduction of what we did for the past years, 
year, uh, we're gonna have a look at what we have now. So, <clears throat> um, I think this is one of the most important slides of the talk. Um, this is what Equinix Metal sponsors and what give, they gives us uh, for free, uh, which represents uh, a whooping $13,000 amounts. Uh, so we are having three operations, uh, three main operations, the Kubernetes cluster, the various runners that we run for the CI, and the um, one weird thing that we have mini packet not first of the talk that is using for the kick cache that I mentioned previously. Okay. Um, so even if so, yeah. Again, thanks a lot, Equinix Metal. Uh, we can't thank you enough. Uh, this is a huge, um, serious step for 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 the community. Uh, we really appreciate that. However, we're still having some issues. Some of them are partly solved as um, since I started working on the slides and know that uh, it's already two weeks in September. Um, but let's let's go um, let's go into into that a little bit deeper. The first one, the logging and the metrics are were not really stable. Uh, what happened was that uh, it was working. So Elasticsearch and Kibana was working well enough uh, until we are actually using a lot more uh, data right now. Uh, it, it was up to the point where we were able to store only like three days of logs inside Elasticsearch. And um, it was immediately broken. Uh, so if we were not here to prune the logs and to ensure that it was uh, working fine, and every time there was an issue, uh, whenever we have to go to the logs, then the logs were not here, so we can't find solve the issue and, and get it there. So beginning of September, I uh, decided to switch uh, uh, Elasticsearch to use Loki, which is a project by Grafana, to just store everything um, from the Kubernetes logs, and but we would keep still Elasticsearch from everything that needs to be deeply tagged uh, so we can do a quick search over amongst all of the errors and all this kind of stuff. Uh, it's still in progress because I still need to implement some data retention rules. Right now, we are just logging everything and wait and see how many days of logs we can, can keep. Uh, but this is something that uh, that is working already uh, very well. The next topic, uh, which um, was the most uh, seen by the community was the 502s that we were having uh, periodically usually on monday morning um in the wild backups were running well at least i blame the backup uh it it seemed to be ready to network uh when we did the initial uh test um because a heavy traffic on the object storage on safe objects files tend to kill some of the disks uh, and the problem is that when you kill the disks, the safe cluster entirely gets like lost and needs to rebuild itself. And there is some watchdogs that are in place, but yeah, it takes 15 minutes roughly to get it back together. And my idea was that WireGuard was a probably good candidate uh, for mixing up the network. Whenever you write something on the safe disk right now, today, um, you encrypt the data three times because we we have three times redundancy for all of the data. So maybe that's not the best solution. There's the possibility that there is another culprit, which is Ceph directly, uh, because all the time, it seems like it was related to some Ceph nodes um, crashing. So if it's network related, we've got some action planned with Daniel Stone. Um, and that would be to create some VLANs and Equinix Metal just for Kubernetes. The Equinix Metal allows you to create VLANs directly and connect them to the various machines that you're having. Um, and we would be able to isolate the traffic and rely on the VLAN for the privacy instead of rely on WireGuard. So, and see if that help. By the way, if anybody is interested in looking into that and if you, they want to play with us with K3S, Kubernetes and whatnot, we would be glad to add one or two more people to the to the team. 
the other option was that it was self-related. Um, and actually, it's um, something I did um, last week. I actually read the docs on Ceph and realized that I haven't read it properly. And I had to tweak the memory request and limits for Ceph and disk. Since then, um, we only had 27 errors in the past eight days. And that is to compare to the last time the ORM killer came in and gave us 35,000 errors over 30 minutes. So what happened was that the process that was monitoring the disk saw that they had the full amount of RAM available to them. But when you have 12 disks, you have 12 process fighting for 256 gigs of memory. Um, at some point, the memory killer comes in and say, well, nope. It just kills the process and that puts some mess in the cluster. So by tweaking the memory request and limits, it actually ensure the process know, hey, I only have four gigs available, not 250. But yeah, I still want the previous part done uh, because that would be awesome. So please help. Okay, uh, so that is something directly towards uh, the board. Uh, we want to have um, an entirely sponsored bill for the cluster, or at least I want, would be nice. Um, so can we just ditch Google Cloud Storage uh, for uh, the registry and rely on our own um, cluster to serve the registry images, the container images? So in theory, yes, we have enough space, right? But last year we were having six terabytes of data and today we are having 10 terabytes of data, which means that we are growing way too much for something that we can't handle uh, in a local um, storage. So there is an ongoing plan actually from GitLab to change the registry architecture that we could use. Um, right now, if you have a look at the, um, at the registry, um, the way it's working, it's a file system based. So whenever you try to walk through uh, all of the list of the containers that are in a particular registry, the registry server would uh, access Google Cloud Storage for every single um, manifest that you have for every single tag that you're having. This is less than ideal, and we're having 10 terabytes of image. You can imagine how nice it is. So what GitLab is trying to do is they are trying to use a proper database, uh, which would allow uh, something to, so in terms of, we would have some performance um, improvements, I expect, but we will also be able to use some garbage collector while the registry is working and in, um, and in read write uh, conditions. GitLab is uh, taking care of everything. They are taking care of the migration also. They are writing some great plans on how to do migrations. And turns out that we will be able to serve both registry at the same time and do the migration one by one without having anybody noticing that there has been some migration. Uh, so we'll use that opportunity to bring back our data in-house and to reduce the cluster bill. So in summary, uh, it's scheduled for late 2021 if time permits and if GitLab manages to enable that, uh, which is not sure because they were supposed to start this this summer and I haven't seen anything yet. <clears throat> However, if anybody wants to be involved in the sysadmin team or in the broader GitLab team, uh, we need some scripts to choose which image are still valid. So you can do that at your own um, project level, uh, you can clean that up. But if you're using CI templates, then you can do that in a generic way because CI templates add some uh, CI templates add some tags to the um, to to the various images that we have. And if you if you look at them, you can know whether the image is supposed to be trashable or if it's something that we can we have to keep it forever. So you don't need to have any strong Kubernetes knowledge or all we need is people with some scripting knowledge, being bash, rust or whatever, um, go even, uh, because you just need to talk to the registry. It's a simple API. You even have some tools like Scopio to talk to the registry. So we just need some good help. 
Okay, uh, next thing that we need to do uh, are integrating Minio packet into the cluster. Okay, if you look at the slide from a little bit of uh, time previously, uh, you can see that there is uh, this one Minio packet .org, which is one large, uh, extra large uh, system, which seems very similar to one of the runners. And basically what we did was create one more, extract one runner from the pool. So if we can manage to integrate many of packet into the cluster, we will have one more runner uh, without uh, Equinix Metal noticing that we are using uh, one more runner for, for the machine. So that would be nice. That would not inf inflict a new burden for Equinix Metal. However, uh, there is some issues and the way that the the thing that we are deploying right now is Minio and OPR there. And so far as we already saw in the previous slides, if you are still awake, um, Minio is not working very well with a new cluster. There are a lot of issues there, so not an option. Um, so we could rely on self storage, but self storage doesn't work properly with GitLab JWT tokens. That is, uh, that is an issue because that's the way we used to uh, authenticate with the with the storage. That's very convenient, so we need to find a work around that. Uh, and last but not least, uh, OPA, which is Open Policy Agent, I should have put in the slide properly, uh, is uh, actually if you enable that in Ceph, it's supposed to be working, but it turns out that there is a segmentation fault and there is a config. So, yeah. We've got some work to do. As of today, the current solution, and which is not entirely prototyped, is to use key clock to convert the GitLab token into key clock token. Uh, that would also leverage uh, some other facilities from uh, our cloud hosting. Uh, key clock is an identity provider, so we could rely on key clock to have some fancy other things that I actually don't know about, but that would be very nice to have. Um, to solve the fact that OPA is crashing um, our configuration, uh, there is a solution which is uh, put a proxy in front of safe object storage nodes, uh, well, the pods, to, that would talk to OPA and validate or not the, the request. So, Istio seemed like a good thing. And as in the previous steps, uh, if anybody wants to get involved with Keyclock, OPA, Istio, and Kubernetes, all of the fancy new keywords, I would be glad to give you a crash course on what we currently have. Okay, last but not least, uh, this is something um, that would be very nice for us. Uh, that would be if we were able to include the runners in the cluster. Uh, why the runner are still manually, manually administered? It was automatically deployed. It's automatically deployed though. Um, but that also means that the change in the configuration requires some manual inter intervention. Uh, also, whenever we want, uh, whenever we upgrade the, uh, the various runners, we need to upgrade them manually one by one. And so that's uh, that sort of time spent for basically nothing. The other thing that we'd like to have is metrics. Uh, they are twofold. It would allow us to know whether the clusters and the CI is underutilized or overutilized. And it actually, at some point, I had one. I had one runner inside the cluster, like just to to see if the metrics were working. And turns out that it allowed me to realize that somebody was actually using our CI to do some uh, by Bitcoin mining. Um, so if we were able to have some metrics from the runners directly, that would be really, really nice. However, there's one thing that uh, people from, I mean, users from uh, GitLab and the freedom of the talk needs to be aware of is as soon as we do that, we won't be able to have privileged runners anymore, which means uh, that Docker in Docker will not work in the near future. If you're using Docker in Docker, it's working, but it will not at some point. If you use CI templates, it will continue to work because we will ensure that CI templates work. Uh, 
The reason is because C8 templates can work in a dockerized environment when Docker in Docker actually needs to have access to the host. We also need Minoyo Packet to release its machine so we can actually not add one more machine because we already think that we are using a lot of Equinix metal. Uh, so that would be uh, that would be nice if we could release that first. So we've got some actions there. Uh, we need to deploy, a, uh, we need to write the Kubernetes deployment for them. Uh, we can't really use the Kubernetes deployment from GitLab uh, because there are some things that we don't like, like the fact that every time it recreates a pod, there is a new reg runner registered and we like having things stable. Um, also, we would like to ensure that the runner jobs are on a different VLAN than the main clusters and they are not capable of accessing the cluster at all. Uh, this is something that needs a bit of investigation. Okay, so we are approaching the end of the talk. Uh, prepare your Q&A if you want. But uh, there, are, there are a few lessons learned uh, from the past year. The first one that I, that I learned for, from, uh, for the first few months last year, since last XDC at least, was that Google Cloud Platform gives a lot of benefits. Um, you get logs for free, you get a lot of things, you don't have to care about uh, virtual IPs, you don't have to care about to a lot of things. But it comes with a cost, of course, that you have to pay for it. Um, so I think that we are still not in a perfect cluster environment because we are seeing some errors in there and they, it still requires a little bit of maintenance from time to time, but we're getting better. Um, last week, I would have said that we are not in a perfect cluster environment at all, but now we are almost there. Uh, I would like to take uh, 30 seconds to two minutes to thank the free desktop community, at least the people on Ash free desktop from FTC. Um, Every time I mess up pretty badly, nobody complains. Uh, I think last last week, only one person complained about 5020 and it was immediately shut down by so many years from the community. So thanks, thanks a lot for that. Um, I really appreciate that. Uh, if anybody wants to get involved, uh, the community around the admins is really nice. I mean, uh, I don't think that we see some invites and um, we, and, and the rest of the community is very, is very nice. So, so that's that's a very welcoming place. And last but not least, I would like to thank once more Equinix Metal uh, for their support there, uh, because uh, without them, I'm pr pretty sure that we would have to kill the entire CI and the entire GitLab uh, because it was way too expensive for the organization. So that's it. Uh, and now I'm open to any questions that you may have or may not have. We indeed do have some. And uh, Martin Ruka has not a question, but just wanted to say in the stream that he cannot overstate how much of a hero Benjamin is. He had a taste of what 1% of his work when failing at deploying Indico on the cluster, and you were so nice and helpful. Thanks. So you have a fun club. <laughs> so. Ladies and gentlemen, please come and help volunteer some time to help redesk the park. Yeah. And now we have three questions. Uh, first okay. from Simon Sir. What makes Minio not work on the new cluster exactly? Something not fixable. So on the new cluster, what happened was that I was using um, so on the old oh, let me let me okay, so in in the Minio packet. Minio is working really fine, except that Minio, the way that we deployed it was Minio single server. It's uh, you, you just run one process, it has access to the disk and it's working very fine, very well. And the new cluster, uh, we wanted to have, to, we wanted to be able to shut down any machines at any time. So we deployed Minio cluster, which is a new variant of Minio that basically allows you to uh, have several pods on several machines that um, where you can actually uh, talk to the various, uh, you, you talk to one of the service and it would propagate the data across all of the machines that you have in the cluster. The problem is that the Minio cluster right now, the way it's deployed doesn't have access to the topology of the Kubernetes cluster, which means that uh, what we had 
uh, was that instead of having a, an event replication across the three nodes that we were having, uh, we were having one node with all of the data, with all of the pods related to the Mino cluster on the same node, which means that whenever this machine was taken down, it was completely, uh, the cluster was completely uh, lost and didn't know how to work. Um, in the same way, uh, whenever we were hammering the Minayo cluster with the artifacts, the Minayo seemed to be really lost in what it needs to be doing. And it was not well working enough to, for us to, for all of the uh, heavy workload that we have. So maybe we can fix that, um, but I'm afraid it's way out of my beak. Okay, and one more question from Daniel Vetter. Uh, we're using QEMU to run cross-compiler ARM unit tests in IGT. Will that keep working with CI runners in the cluster? Yes, uh, so the privileged runner would, would mean that we the, the runner will be running in a sandboxed environment, properly sandboxed, um, but we will still export VKMS, uh, DKMS or whatever. Uh, I mean, we will still export the, the, the various uh, card. Uh, we will still export the various, no, it's not the KMS, sorry. Um, any, we will still allow the QMU to run properly uh, there. The only thing is that if we run the, um, in a non-privileged, in the privileged environment right now, you can get out of the sandbox, access the files to the, to the, to the cluster, and actually directly talk to the various nodes in the cluster, which is not something we want from the runners. So we will ensure that we'll keep the service. Um, the only thing that will shut down is the current Docker, as far as I can think. OK, and it looks like that's it for questions for now. So thank you very much for your excellent talk, and uh, I'll see you on IRC in a moment. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.